Lux Radio Theater brings you Don Amici, Ida Lupino, Mae Robeson, and Helen Wood in The Young and Heart. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. When you live by your wits without much attention to hard work, every road leads to trouble. That's the way it is with these lovable renegades, the Carltons, in our play, The Young and Heart, until they meet a lady named Fortune, and not the notorious Dame Fortune either. Just a plain, silver-haired, very gentle old lady, whose first name is Ellen. She teaches them that happiness doesn't always go with irresponsibility, and in fair exchange, they teach her how to be young in heart. And that's a trick everyone wants to know. A good beginning for the ladies, of course, is to use Lux toilet soap. We know that a woman is only as old as she looks. So by helping her keep lovely in appearance, Lux toilet soap helps her keep young in heart, too. Our play, The Young in Heart, is adapted from David O. Selznick's first motion picture. Fine motion picture. And requires a, a highly versatile cast. Some actors can be great actors in only one kind of part. So before engaging any of our stars, we examined their previous performances on the screen and at our microphone to make sure they had all the talents this play demands. That's the reason Don Amici, Ida Lupino, Mae Robeson, and Helen Wood are gathered at this microphone tonight. In our drama, Don Amici plays that professional avoider of hard work, Richard Carlton, although actually Don has done just about every kind of work that Richard has avoided. May Robeson is the gentle lady, Ellen Fortune. And I'll guarantee there's no one in Hollywood who better deserves the title of young in heart. She's earned it in 57 years on stage and screen without missing a single season. Ida Lupino plays Don Amici's sister, George Ann Carlton. And we welcome her with a cheer for her fine work in the new Paramount picture, The Light That Failed. It's curtain time now for Act One of The Young in Heart. Starring Don Amici as Richard... Ida Lupino as George Ann, May Robeson as Ellen Fortune, and Helen Wood as Leslie. The French Riviera on the golden shores of the Mediterranean Sea is a sort of Coney Island with a monocle. Here, millionaire mothers come to seek a glamorous son in law, while tired fathers look for ways to get, well, trimmed. To this bright haven of fortune hunters come the Carlton family. On the morning of their arrival, they read their press notices with pleased smiles. Carlton family arrives for son's marriage. Colonel Anthony Carlton, the Pucker Sahib. Uh, that's you, Dan. <coughs> quite right, quite right. Having served with the Bengal Lancers in India, has arrived with his charming wife. Uh, that's you, Mommy. How nice. And the lovely daughter, George Ann. That's you, Georgie. Oh, thank you, sir. To join their son, Richard. That's me. The engagement was recently announced to Richard Carlton. Oh, that's me again. To Miss Adela Jennings, daughter of former Senator Albert Jennings of Georgia, USA. That's quite yeah, nice. Don't you think? Nice. They call me Charlie. Just one week later, another notice appears in the newspaper. This time, not quite so flattering. Carlton family proved to be imposters. The gentleman known as Colonel Anthony Carlton, Pucker Sahib, has been definitely exposed as a fraud. That's you, Sahib. Quite right, quite right. According to the police, he's never been in India, but was formerly an actor with his wife in a Toronto stock company. I wonder how they found that out. The engagement of Richard Carlton, that's me, has been definitely cancelled. The police have asked the Carlton family to leave the Riviera on the earliest possible train. Mm. <laughs> listen to them, George, Ann, will you? Just listen to them. Hmm? Who? Mommy and Sahib, three million dollars tossed away, and they sing. Yeah, we nearly had it, right in our hands. Dick, did Adela Jennings really have three million? Oh, at least. My, how I love that girl. Did you say goodbye to her? No, 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 no. Saying goodbye to the three million was all I could stand. Well, I just wish we knew what we were going to do now. Oh, boy, I've never been so hungry in my life. I said, by the way, Sister Mine, didn't I see you with a new ring on last night? Uh, uh, I thought perhaps when we got on the train, we might be able to swap it for uh, a couple of chops. Oh, well, that... Well, that ring wasn't mine. I just borrowed it for the evening. Oh, uh -huh, that's too bad. So what's the matter with us, anyway? We're, why can't we ever own anything? Well, nobody ever owns anything except nice, dull people, and mm. they always get on to us sooner or later. Yeah, uh, yes. Dick. What? Dick, did you 
ever know anybody who married for love? I mean, where, well, where somebody who didn't have any money married somebody who didn't have any money? Uh, uh, what, what did you say they married for? Well, for love, you know. No, no, no. Do you think people like that are ever happy? Say, have you anything particular in mind? Oh, no. No, I was just thinking. What are you getting mad? What, what's happened to you, anyway? Why? What do you mean? What are you getting so soft about? Soft? Don't be silly. It's only that... Only what? What's the matter? Well, it's only that I didn't even say goodbye. S- say, <laughs> you're, you're not in love with that, that Scotsman fellow, are you? That uh, uh, Duncan McCrae that uh, you've been hanging around with here? How could I be in love with him? He hasn't any money. Well, then I can't think what you have to cry about. <laughs> Neither can I. Say, wait, wait a second. Was he the one who, who, who lent you the ring? Yes. And you gave it back to him? Yes. Of your own free will? Yes. Oh, George Ann, you're crazy. I know it. <laughs> Jane, will you please dry your eyes and put some powder in your nose? You can't let Mommy and Saheed see you like this. Oh, I'm all right. Now, look, everything's going to be fine. Tomorrow morning we'll be in Paris and... We, uh, oh, hey, look. What? Do you see what I see on the floor just outside that compartment door? Is that a big, red, juicy apple or uh, uh, just another mirage? Oh, it's an apple. That's what I thought. Come on, come on. I'll just... Oh. Uh, oh, 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 I'm sorry, madam. I, uh, I was just uh, going to pick up this apple. Oh, thank you. Oh, yeah. Uh, you mean it's uh, your apple, madam? I believe it is. Oh. <laughs> Here you are, madam. <clears throat> Thank you. Oh, not at all, not at all. Are you, uh, are you honeymooning? Me? Oh, oh you mean, uh, uh, no, no, no. This is my sister. Oh, how do you do, my dear? How do you do? Uh, won't you come in and sit down a while? You you look tired, my dear. Uh, well, Yes, no, yes, I... yes, of course we will. Delighted. Uh, yes. <laughs> I think it's so interesting meeting people on trains, don't you? Oh, rather. Yeah. You know? I was just sitting here wondering how I was going to spend the evening. I don't like to see night come, do you, dear? Well, I... I don't think I ever noticed. No, you're so young. But when you're old, night comes always too soon. But, uh... But, uh, you... You seem troubled, my dear. Is anything wrong? Uh, anything? Oh, no, I... Well, uh, well uh, there, there is, in a way. You see, uh, uh, George Ann's worried, uh... Uh, about mother. Oh. Yes, yes. Uh, m- mother has to have an operation. Oh, dear. Oh, tell me, dear, tell me. Uh, well, she's um, she's so tired and the train's so crowded. And... Yeah, yes, and, and uh, there's no room for it to lie down, you see. We're second class. Oh, and here I am in this big compartment all alone. Why, you go and bring her in here. Oh, could we really? Why, of course. Oh, thank you, thank you so much. It, it's, uh, it, it's all been rather difficult. Uh, I mean, with the side, too. Uh, that's my father. Uh, he, he can't help much. Uh, he was gassed, you know, in, in the war. Oh, bring him, too. Oh, that's awfully good of you. No, it's good of you to trust me. <laughs> you know, it's so seldom we have the privilege of helping one another. Oh, now go. Go and bring them in here, please. Please do. How kind you are. I don't know you, do I? No, I'm a new friend. My name is Fortune, Miss Ellen Fortune. Miss Fortune? <laughs> yes. Silly name, isn't it? Everybody makes jokes about it. I do myself. <laughs> not at all, not at all. A fine historic name, not a subject for jesting. Allow me to introduce my wife, ma'am. How do you do? Uh, my daughter. Oh, I know her. My son and uh, your servant, Colonel Anthony Carlton, <clears throat> later the Bengal Lancers. Oh, the <laughs> Bengal Lancers, how splendid. And yet the wretched government refuses him a pension and lets his family starve. If only he hadn't gone back to the war after that dreadful wound. Yes, Mommy, yes. Yes? Oh, a gas too, of course. Don't be absurd, Richard. Did you think I'd forgotten? If I have a breath left in me to give my country, he used to say... He's never been right since. Uh, now, Mommy, you, you know it isn't good for you to talk so much. Don't overdo it. If you could only force yourself to eat something, Mommy dear. Oh, no, no, no. 
It would choke me. I'm sure it would. Uh, well, would it uh, help if I ate something with you, Mommy? Uh, it might. Please. I'd try anything to please you, dear boy. Uh, I think we should all make the effort. Uh, you will uh, be our guest, of course, Miss Fortune? Oh, your guest, yes. Oh, no. No, now, this is my compartment. You must all be my guests. Now, I insist. Oh, right. No, 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 I insist. <laughs> I insist. <laughs> Will you have another brandy, Colonel? Don't mind if I do. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I've so often imagined parties like this, <laughs> when I might be celebrating with friends on some occasion, a birthday perhaps, or... Uh, my little girl's going to have a birthday this year. Oh, let's pretend it's right now, tonight. All right, let's. <laughs> Just 20 odd years ago today. In dear old Ireland. <laughs> if I thought 20 odd years ago that my little girl would come out in a French railway carriage. Look, Sai, we're pretending it's a birthday. Well, if I pretended 20 odd years ago that my little girl would be born in a French railway carriage. Uh, can I help you with that brandy, darling? Just put it no, on no, here. No, no, no. If I pretended 20 odd years ago that I would give birth to a little French railway carriage again, I'd have shot myself. Uh, <gasps> Miss Fortune, uh, you must forgive this. Sahib. He lives in a little world all his own. <laughs> what fun. You're all so young, so young in heart, like John Dickey. John Dickey? Uh, he, John Dickey, ma'am? Yes, he, he he was someone I used to know a long time ago. <clears throat> Won't you have some brandy with me, ma'am? Oh, what a shame. Hey. Uh, uh, beg your pardon, Miss Fortune? Oh, I was thinking of the hundreds of bottles in my home in England, just gathering dust. Really, ma'am? Dust. Hundreds of bottles? Yes, but I'm not going to think of that lonely old house now. Do you mm. know, this is the only and the first real party I've ever had. You see, I've always had to live such a simple life. And now that I have enough money to do everything I want, I... <laughs> I really don't know what I do want or where to start. <clears throat> and uh, you're traveling alone, ma'am? Yes. It's been rather a sad journey till now. But do you know, you've all made this one of the... one of the happiest days of my life. <clears throat> Delighted. Pleasure is all ours, my dear lady. I, I raise my glass for the first time in my life gladly to misfortune. <laughs> misfortune in the true sense of the word is a thing rarely to be praised. But to our misfortune, to the misfortune... Uh, listen, life. listen, it's funny that, that whistle... Uh, you don't suppose anything's wrong? Well, it, it sounds as if... Sound, sounds just as if... Are you all right? Yeah, we're all right. Oh, goodness, what happened? Bumped into a train ahead. Say, wh where's Miss Fortune? She's lying over here. Was she... Is she dead? Well, she's unconscious, but I don't think she's badly hurt. Well, I, I thought for a moment, poor old girl. Uh, come on, come on, let's get her out of here. Can you carry a dick? Yes, I think so. Uh, here, uh, take my coat and put it over her. Give me a hand here. Careful now, careful. Mommy, my dear, are you sure you're not hurt? I don't think so, Sahib. But then I don't know how you're supposed to feel after a train wreck. There's England, Mommy, a good crossing, I'd say. I thought it was very nice of Miss Fortune to pay our way, didn't you? Well, if the old girl doesn't cough up something after all we've done for her, I'll lose my faith in human nature. Well, we've been very kind to her. We've eaten all our meals with her and... Georgian, you know, dear, I'm going to miss you all dreadfully. It isn't only that you saved my life. But you've all been so wonderful to me. Oh, but Miss Fortune, it'll be nice for you to get back to your lovely big home and see all your friends again. But I haven't any friends or relatives, George Ann. They're all gone. Oh, I, I'm sorry. But didn't I hear you mention a Mr. Dickey? Oh, yes, John Dickey. In America once, when I was very young, a long time ago, I was engaged to John Dickey. Oh, I was so young. I hadn't learned the meaning of faith. One day someone told me that John loved someone else. We quarreled. And I've regretted that, that quarrel ever since. Hoping that someday I might 
I might see or hear from him. Well, I did. It was to learn that he had gone back to England, made a fortune there, and died all alone, leaving everything to me. Oh, George Ann, we must have faith in those we love. We must have faith or go through life. Oh, I'm sorry you're so alone. George Ann? Yes, sire. We'll be in port in a few minutes, my dear. You'd better finish whatever you have to do. Miss Fortune, oh, I, I wish there was something. I mean, I, I wish there was some way that we could see you sometimes in London. Oh, George Ann, if... Oh, no. Oh, no, no. You couldn't, that lonely old house. But, George Ann, if you could, all of you, come and stay with me and be my guests. Oh, just for a little while. Could you? Oh, well, I... I don't know what the side would think. He hates so to impose on people. Yes, but it wouldn't be imposing. Well... I'll ask him. I'll try to persuade him. But I'd love to come. Uh, just to be with you. Oh, dear. Miss Fortune, it's good to see you. Oh, Mr. Anstruther, how nice for you to be here and to welcome me home. Oh, not at all, Miss Fortune. It's a great pleasure to have you back, safe and well. George Ann. This is Mr. Felix Anstruther. He was... He was John Dickey's lawyer and friend, and mine, too. Uh, Mr. Anstruther, these are my friends, the Carlton. Uh, how do you do? How do you do? You know, these are the people who saved my life in the train wreck. Well, I'm sure I'm most grateful to them for that. Yes, yes, indeed. <laughs> Miss, uh, Miss Fortune seemed a little bit lonely here, and we uh, we all thought we might just stay here with us, as long as she was kind enough to ask her. Oh, ask her. really? Yes. You're going to stay here in this house? Yeah, just, just for a few days. Well, that's very considerate of you, I'm sure. I, uh, I'm afraid now that I must leave for my train. Oh, uh, uh, where, you, where are you off to? Paris first. Oh, Paris? Oh, I see. I was thinking I might need a lawyer myself pretty soon to manage my affairs. Perhaps on your return... I shall be happy, Mr. Carlton, to look into your affairs. Just as soon as I return... <laughs> Good day, Miss Fortune. I'm, uh, I'm sorry that my business takes me away at this time. Goodbye. Goodbye, Miss Fortune. Goodbye. 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 Dick. Dick, wake up. No, no, no go away. Where you go? Oh, don't be stubborn, Dick. Wake up. Come in, Mommy. Come inside. No, uh, hey. Hey, what, what, what's the matter? What? Uh, are we packing up again? No, no, no. I've been thinking, and I have everything worked out. No, oh, no. Oh, uh, did you work out what happened to the top of my pajamas then? Oh, shut up, Dick. I have an idea. Oh. <laughs> Why don't you sit down, Mary? <laughs> oh, I thought I was. Dear, yeah, dear. Now, listen, listen, all of you. We've been planning on staying here for a couple of weeks. But where do we go then? No, I give up where. Now, what I mean is, we can stay here forever. All we have to do is to go on being what she thinks we uh, are. Charming, you mean? No. Decent, honest, sober, and hardworking. And just what do you mean by that? I mean, Sive, no funny business with the cards. No running up bills, no brandy. No brandy? And you, Dick, you'll have to look for a job and take the side with you. What a job? Oh, Richard, you won't let her do this to me. You won't. No, it sounds too busy. And for what? No sooner do we do all this and she'll up and die, and then we're out again. Oh. Unless... Unless what? Unless she makes a will. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And there's not only the house. Is Mr. Dickey's entire fortune. Uh-huh. If we've ever had a chance at a permanent solution, this is it. How cute of you, George Ann. All right, I'm game. I'll be a grandson of the old girl if it kills us both. What do you say, Saib? For the sake of all of you, I'm prepared to make any sacrifice. Fine, fine. John, dear, are you listening you know how I've come and spoken to you like this every night. And how afraid I've been. Well, John, dear, you don't have to worry about me anymore. I'm not afraid any longer. I've found friends, John. I've found friends. Mr. 
Mr. DeMille will return in a moment in Act Two, starring Don Amici, Ida Lupino, May Robeson, and Helen Wood in The Young and Heart. But first, I'd like you to listen to a few of what we radio people call sound effects. All right, here's the first one. <laughs> Why, that sounds like some girls yawning. What does that mean, Mr. Ruick? It means they're sleepy. They've had a busy day. Some of them have been secretarying in busy offices. Some of them have been taking care of their families all day, and... Some of them are screen stars. That's right. Some of them are girls who star in the movies. Well, now here's the next sound effect. Why, well, that's water running, and I know what for. Yes, you do, Sally. But maybe the ladies in our audience don't know that the water's running because all these lovely women are too clever to go to bed without taking their active lather facial. A bedtime beauty care with Lux Toilet Soap that Hollywood stars and clever girls everywhere find really works. Come on, Sally, let's tell how to make take an active lather facial, a beauty care that Hollywood is so keen about. Well, I, I can't do any better than to quote lovely Olivia de Havilland. She tells her friends to take a Lux Soap active lather facial this way. First, work up a nice, rich Lux Toilet Soap lather on your hands and pat it lightly into your skin. Cover your face completely. And then? Rinse it all off. First with warm water, then a dash of cool. And then? Dry your skin by patting it lightly. And then look in your mirror and see how fresh it looks. There, Mr. Ruick. That's Olivia de Havilland's active lather facial. Simple, easy, and a grand tip for any woman. Yes, and if you take a Lux Toilet Soap active lather facial every night before you go to bed, you know you've protected your skin. Because you know you've removed dust and dirt, stale cosmetics, thoroughly. You're going to have real beauty sleep. You all know how important that is? Later on this evening, we're going to tell you why this bedtime care with active lather is so important. Now, we want to urge you to try it. You want your skin to stay beautiful. Of course you do. Buy three cakes of Lux Toilet Soap tomorrow. Then try these active lather facials for 30 days. See if they're not a wonderful help in keeping your skin as smooth, soft as you want it to be. Now our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of The Young and Heart, starring Donna Michi as Richard Carlton, Ida Lupino as George Ann, May Robeson as Ellen Fortune, and Helen Wood as Leslie. The enterprising Carltons have sensed a fortune in misfortune, with free room and board thrown in while they wait for the old lady to make a will in their favor. Anxious to create the right impression, Colonel Carlton, Paka Sahib, has overcome his natural instincts and has actually found himself a job selling motor cars. On the threshold of the Wombat Motor Car offices, the Colonel and Richard exchange fond farewells. Well, Richard, nine o'clock. Yes, right so, Sahib. I never really believed anyone would answer my advertisement. It wasn't fair, sir. Well, too late for remorse now, son. Chin up and all that. Yes, sir, yes, sir, but it does seem a shame. Well, I, I'll never forget the pleasant days we've spent together. Ah, uh, we never did half the things we planned to do. Oh, I wish... I wish we could at least have got to the aquarium. It won't be the same without you, Sahib. <clears throat> nice of you to say so, my boy. <clears throat> Miss you, too. Well, I'd better go in now, start work, and... Uh... What are you staring at, Richard? Uh, uh, that uh, sign, see? Boy wanted good prospects, supply office 313. My boy, you aren't thinking of Richard. Oh, no, 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 uh, just an idea, Saeed, with uh, you working out of things, so to speak. No, 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 uh, I won't stand for it. It's my duty to make sacrifices for the family. Very well, sir. Well, <clears throat> better go. Not much good at farewells. Oh, I, I know, Father. Uh, your hand, son. Goodbye, my boy. Goodbye, Father. Goodbye, yeah. Boy, I wanted good prospects. My office 313. Come in. Morning. Morning. This office 313, isn't it? Yes. Well, saw so you sign downstairs and. Uh, you're very pretty. Thank you. Go on. Uh, uh, yeah, mind if I sit down? I'm very tired. Walking, you know. Oh, 
Are you sure you're quite comfortable? Yeah, quite comfortable. Do you mind? You planning to stay long? Well, I haven't, but now that I see you again... You've never seen me before. Yeah, I've seen you all my life, in my dreams. That's not a very good line. Now, what do you want? Why are you here? Well, I was, uh, I was walking along, and suddenly an unseen spirit grabbed me by the arm and led me straight up here to you. It's kismet. Uh, do you think that means we have to marry each other? Uh, if you're not uh, otherwise engaged, of course. I do not. Oh. And I can't make up my mind whether you're a lunatic or merely very young. Well, I'm neither. I'm, uh, I'm just lonely. I see. Well, what can you do besides look rather too good-looking? Well, I'm a champion swimmer, play a rattling game of tennis, spare golf, and I rumble like the angel Gabriel. Did you happen to notice the name of this organization? No, no. To be frank with you, I never had a job before, and I felt it might spoil my impulse. This is the British American Civil and Hydraulic Engineering Company. Oh, I see. And you're the American, huh? Well, uh, don't hydraulic engineers ever rumba? Rarely. And not well. Well, then it seems to me I should be filling a crying need. <laughs> you know, I, uh, I really think I'll enjoy working here. I, uh, I kind of like the atmosphere of the place. The atmosphere is strictly business. Yeah, which is what I like. Say, did anyone ever tell you you had the most beautiful... Yes, often. Oh. Um, you don't know the first thing about engineering, do you? Oh, what's the two? It all comes down to one man saying to another, well, make up your mind. You want to buy a bridge or don't you want to buy a bridge? I've never met a man before who's never had a job. Well, I should think that would intrigue you. Make you want to see what you could make of him. All right. We need someone to sort the mail. Two pounds a week. Come back in the morning, 8 o'clock. I am yours to command. Uh, uh, by the way, uh, couldn't make that 9 o'clock, could you? 8 o'clock. Good day. Oh, good day. Uh, 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 could you uh, come out with me later for dinner? I uh, kind of like to pay my obligations. But can you pay for the dinner? Huh? Oh, well, now that you mention it, I'm afraid I can't. In that case, I'll wait until your first payday. Good day. Pardon, Miss Carlton. Mm? Oh, yes, Henry. There's a gentleman to see you, Miss Carlton. To see me? Well, who is he? He didn't give his name, Miss, but he says he knows you from the Riviera. From... Oh, Henry, is he... Um, is he a Scotsman? Aye, a Scotsman. Duncan! Uh, you may go, Henry. Very good, Miss. Well, Miss Carlton. Well, hello, Duncan. Uh, where did you come from? Now, don't try to be offhand with me, George Ann. I'm very, very angry. I had to take a flying machine to catch you, and I cannot afford to hire flying machines to chase your boat. Well, nobody asked you to chase me about. You're a daft and undependable female. Don't you dare address me that way, Duncan McRae. Stand still and listen to me. We're going to be married to each other. We're not going to be married to each other. I don't care if your father does cheat at cards. I forgive you. What? And your brother's a worthless fortune hunter. But I forgive you because you're only daft and I can cure you. You, you can't cure me. I mean, I, I'm just as worthless as they are. You're not. You're a good girl, Georgian. And you promised to marry me that night on the Riviera. Yes, and you know why. Why? Well, because if Richard had married Adela Jennings there, we'd have had three million dollars and we could all have lived on it. That's why. You're hysterical. I'm not hysterical. How did you know I was here? There was a notice in the paper when you left. There was also a notice when the train was wrecked. And then I saw your father's advertisement asking for a position. I laughed very heartily. Oh, <laughs> well, you needn't have. He's working, and so is my brother. I don't believe it. And what are you doing in this house, anyway? Well, Miss Fortune was grateful to us for helping her in the wreck, so she invited us to stay with her. She's uh, very lonely. Hey, she must also be very rich. I think you better go, Duncan. I'm, I'm terribly busy. You're also terribly fidgety, George Ann. Fidgety? What a silly idea. I know you're toozling your hair. I, I'm not toozling my hair. Oh, no, you're losing your temper, George Ann. I told you I'm, I'm very busy, Duncan, and I wish you'd please go. Once and for all, will you marry me? No. No, no. Now get out. Aye, I will. Once and for all. <laughs> <laughs> Side. Evening, my boy. Are all the little Wombat motor cars feeling tonight? Couldn't feel better than I do. Fine. Sold my fourth one this week. Commissions mounting rapidly, my boy, rapidly. Oh, really? Oh, uh, by the way, Saib, uh, where, where would you take a young lady to dinner? Well, Savoy, by all means. Soundest cuisine in London. All right, Savoy it should be. Oh, but uh, uh, a couple of pounds wouldn't quite see me through, would it? Oh, yes. Well, perhaps you're being slightly optimistic. Yeah, you couldn't loan me a fiver until next payday, could you? <clears throat> I'd be glad to, my boy, but I've always found that borrowing is unsound. Uh. Both from a financial and a moral point of view. Why don't you take the young lady to the zoo? All right, Saib, all right, never mind. Uh, wait here, here, my boy, five pounds. Enjoy your evening. Take her to the Savoy and the zoo. Thanks, Saib. <laughs> 
Uh, the penguin, flightless aquatic bird, habitat, uh, southern hemisphere. Oscar, I'd like to present Miss Leslie Saunders, my boss. How do you do, Oscar? No answer. Oh, you really must forgive, Oscar. He's a uh, sensitive, lonely, and disillusioned soul. All penguins are. You seem to have a strong sympathy for Oscar. You don't happen to feel anything in common with him. Well, there might be a few similarities. He's very well dressed with his white shirt and black tail. Thank you. <laughs> very amusing, too. Oh, thank you. And I'm afraid utterly worthless. Oh, not your sort, huh? I rather doubt it. Uh-huh. Although, I wonder if you've any ideas to what sort I really am. Oh, of course I have. Sane, practical. That's right. Ambitious, hardworking. That's right. Utterly moral. Utterly. Straight from the shoulder. Straight as a rivet. Well, in that case, I should think you'd greatly admire me if I skipped all the approach work and just kissed you without any preliminaries. I should not only admire you, I should respect you. There's something to be said for your philosophy. <laughs> good evening. I said good evening. Oh. Uh, uh, would, would you mind not... Oh, oh, Mr. Uh, uh... Duncan McRae. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I should like to have a talk with you, Mr. Carlton. Yeah, well, I'm sorry. We're looking at the animals. I should still like to have a talk with you, Mr. Carlton. Now, look, be a nice fella and go away, will you? No. Look, I can't talk to you now. I'm with a lady. I realize the difficulty. I'll just tag along with you till you take her home. Oh, I see. Pleasant evening. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Mind your feet on the stair, man. I'll take the whole road. Now we'll scuttle oh, out. Hush, no, hush. Oh, you. Oh, me. Dick, you'll wake everyone up in the house. Uh, it's all right, it's all right. This is all right. I brought my pal home with me. Yes, yes, I know. We're all palsy well. Now go in there and lie down before I knock you down. No, I have to undress myself. I have to... I have to take off my shoesy woozy. I'll help you. You've helped him enough. That's right, that's right. Take off my shoesy woozy. That's right. Now come on, take him off. Yep, 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 yep. First my shoesy woozies and, and my socksy waxies and, and my tiesy wisies. Oh, I'm sleepy. I'm very sleepy. Duncan. Duncan, you did this. I give you my word of honor, Georgian. I hadn't a slightest idea. You did it on purpose. I did not. How could I know that one bottle of champagne and a few small brandies could make any grown man drunk? Well, why did you give him anything at all? Well, I tell you, I just happened to meet him and, and we celebrated. Celebrated? With him? You must be drunk, too. I'm not. And I can't be. None of us Macrays is capable of being drunk. We've tried. And I admit, I was wrong about Richard. I misjudged him entirely, and I apologized. He's an understanding and gifted young man. And where did you meet this understanding and gifted young man? We just bumped into each other. Uh, if you want to know the truth, I was feeling lonesome. You're a bad-mannered, bad-tempered, outrageous female. But I had discovered I cannot live without you. It's a shameful confession for a sane man to make. It's a silly one, because you're going to live without me. Probably to a horrible old age. I am not. Richard says you're eating your heart out for me. What? Dick told you that. He did. What? George Ann, dear, is anything wrong? Oh, I, I'm dreadfully sorry, Miss Fortune. But poor Dick has been taken ill, and this, this Mr. McRae was kind enough to bring him home. Oh, how do you do, Mr. McRae? How do you do? And that's not the exact truth, Miss Fortune. Poor Richard is extremely drunk. And it is my fault. And now if you've said everything you want to say, you might have the decency to go. Listen, Georgian, don't quarrel with me. I may have to go away. There's a chance I may leave for India. Well, is it only a chance or a hope? Oh, Georgiana, my dear. If my you have dear. the slightest consideration for anyone, you'll, you'll go away and stay away. Aye, once and for all. Goodbye, Georgian. <laughs> oh, my dear, my dear. Young people never seem to realize... That true love never comes twice. Oh. Ooh. Does your head hurt very badly, Richard? My head? My head is on wrong. I know just how you feel. Oh, I've, I've been intoxicated, too. You have? Now, keep the ice bag on your head. Yeah, all right. Oh, it was a long time ago. 
I was very young, but I've never forgotten it. It was at a birthday party. Someone gave me a glass of punch, and all of a sudden, the trees began to go round and round. Yeah, and yeah, round. I know. Was there anyone there to put ice on your head? <laughs> no. But there was a boy there. He was very kind to me. It was John Dickey. He let me hold on to his hand tight to keep me from being plunged into space. Well, it was darn decent of him. Yes, it was. <laughs> and you know, he had such a funny little white dog with him. <laughs> you know, it had a, a black spot, just like an enormous eyebrow over one eye. That sounds like a very nice little dog. It was. Does your head feel better now, dear? Yeah, yeah, much. Uh, Miss, Miss Fortune, don't, don't think... Please don't think badly of me. Why should I think badly of you? You were only being gay and happy and probably proud of your job. And most of all, you're young. Oh, so young. Richard, would you mind telling me something? Certainly not, Leslie. This is my lunch hour. Are we going to visit many more pet shops? All of them, if necessary. I want a puppy with a black eyebrow. And why a black eyebrow? Well, because the puppy is for Miss Ellen, and Miss Ellen likes puppies with black eyebrows. Are you sure this Miss Ellen of yours is quite right? Oh, yes, yes, quite. She's a very nice, rich old lady. I see. You and your family couldn't by any chance be sponging on her, could you? What makes you think that? Just occurred to me. Oh, you, uh... Wouldn't approve of that, I suppose. No, I wouldn't approve of that. No, I didn't think you would. Would you uh, like to hear the rest of it? It's up to you. It's a tremendous secret, you know. Perhaps you shouldn't tell me then. No, I probably shouldn't. You won't like it. Well, they say confession is good for the... Uh, mm, uh, what, what is that? Uh, the soul. The soul, yes, yes. That's right, soul. Well, I suppose it can't affect me much one way or the other, can it? You see, we're all trying to become heirs. I don't understand. Oh, it's very simple. See, we're all quite charming, and we made the old girl love us. Saib took to selling wombats just to prove that we're on the square, and I took to opening uh, letters for the same reason. It's rather a neat idea, don't you think? You're not... You're not fooling me, Richard. Oh, no, no. I'm terribly serious. We thought we worked it out all very cleverly. I never doubted you were clever, Richard. Leslie, wait. L L Leslie! Oh, Dick, where did this come from? Isn't she a dream, George Ann? Her name's Jane of Islesbury. Her father's a champion, you know. Oh, she's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> Look at that eyebrow. It's jet black. Isn't that cute? <laughs> Dick. Dick, you get this horrible monster out of here before Miss Ellen comes home. But she's for Miss Ellen. I bought her for Miss Ellen. And I'm paying for her out of my own salary. Think of that. Oh, Dick. Dick, that's wonderful of you. Are you sure she wants one? Sure. My salary's too small to waste if I weren't sure. Oh, of course. I thought for a moment that you... You just got the puppy because... Well, good work, Dick. Congratulations. Oh, I, I, I didn't... I didn't mean... What? I, uh, what didn't you mean? Well, I, I, I didn't... I didn't want you to think I was... I was getting soft all of a sudden. No. Heaven forbid I should ever think that. Don Amici, Ida Lupino, May Robeson, and Helen Wood will return for the third act of The Young and Heart after this brief intermission. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. You're listening to Same Time, Same Station, the best of old-time radio. And I'm your host, Jerry Hendigas. Continue with the third act of The Young in Heart. Three more weeks have passed, and the Carltons still pursue their policy of friendly fraud. Their charm has endeared them to the wealthy Ellen Fortune, and future prospects are brighter than ever. But now Mr. Anstruther, Ellen Fortune's attorney, 
has returned from his trip on the continent, bringing with him the true facts concerning the calculating Carltons. Misfortune, I assure you these things are true. Your Colonel Carlton was never at any time even a private in the British Army. He's nothing but a common adventurer, a card shopper. The whole family is infamous on the continent. Fortune hunters, frauds. They were last heard of on the Riviera, where the son Richard nearly took in a wealthy young American girl. And they were asked to leave by the police. How sad. Sad? That such fine people should be reduced to such an existence. How cruel life must have been to them. But you don't understand, Miss Fortune. They are not fine people. They're a little better than criminals. And they're in your house now living on you, sponging on you. Who knows what plans they may have against you. Now I understand so many little things that puzzled me. Little glances they exchanged. Little embarrassments they had. Times when they were hurt. And I didn't understand why. Oh, dear, I wish I'd known all this sooner. I could have spared them so much. But you must get rid of the misfortune. They'll, they'll take everything you have. Mr. Anstruther, I'm an old woman, a very old woman. I've lived a lonely and useless life, but I've learned something in my loneliness, perhaps because of it. I've learned not to judge people. I've learned to take people as I find them, not as other people find them. And most of all, I've learned to give complete and unquestioning faith to the people I love. I... I shall say no more, ma'am. Miss Ellen, it's time for your medicine now. I... Oh. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Anstruther? How do you do? Did you have a pleasant trip? Very pleasant. And very interesting. Good evening, Miss Carl. George Ann. What seems to be the matter, dear? Why, I... I didn't know Mr. Anstruther was back from his trip. Oh, yes. We've had a, a long talk, Miss Dranstruther and I. Oh, have you? I've realized for a long time how I have been imposing upon you and your family. Oh, no, I'm not at all. I've wondered what can they possibly gain by giving so much to a lonely old lady. So I finally decided to do at least everything in my power that I can do. But, Miss Ellen, we... We don't want you to do anything. I know you don't. But I want you to know that I've asked Mr. Anstruther to draw me up a new will so that when I die, everything I have will go to you and your family. It isn't all that I would like to leave you, George Ann. I would like to leave you happiness. Oh, Miss Ellen. Miss Ellen. Yes. Thought I told you an hour ago I didn't need you any longer. Oh, it's all right. I just had a little reading to do. Take you home? I think not, thank you. Sorry. Oh, uh, say, you uh, wouldn't like to do the town, would you, with Miss Fortune, the Carlton family, Saturday night, white tie. Ought to be kind of a nice party. Your idea, I suppose? No, no. See, this is a party with a plot. Miss Fortune seems to think that all George Ann and Duncan need is a chance to get together and make up. Thought it might be fun for you to go along and see how... People get together and uh, make up. Are you paying for the party? Me? No, no. Small white dog with a black eyebrow is about all I can afford for several weeks. How is the dog? Oh, he's terrific. Several slippers have gone west, and so Miss Dickey's antique rugs have aged perceptibly, but I couldn't live without her. Did it make your Miss Ellen happy? Oh, yes, immensely. She's mad about it, really. Then the puppy is what you might call a, a wise investment. Yes, as a matter of fact, I think she'll do the trick. Congratulations. I knew you'd be interested. Good night. Good night. Oh, my curiosity. What are you reading? Oh, there's uh, uh, just uh, just something to pick up here. Let me see. Uh, Pollock's Manual of Elementary Engineering. Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, um, I'm trying to find out why grown men waste the time being engineers. When they can be heirs. Yes, yes, exactly. Uh, mm. By the way, the boss said the suggestions you made for the new building were not half bad for an amateur. Well, he did? Not really. Of course, that doesn't mean anything to you. Uh, uh, well, it's... Uh, it's always nice to make an impression on the boss. Yes. You know, on second thought, I think I will go to the party with you Saturday if the invitation's still open. Still open? It's you or no one. I have an idea about you, but it still needs just a little more work. Good night. <laughs> 
Well, a drop of brandy, Miss Ellen. <laughs> no, but don't let that stop you, Colonel. Thank you. Good for the old chest, you know. What about you, Molly? Oh, you know I never touch it drop. George Ann. No, thank you. Miss Leslie. None for me, thank Richard. you. Richard. No, thanks, I... No one? What do you say, Mr. Duncan McCray? Aye, a will. Good boy. Have it while you can. You may not find brandy like this in India, you know. Are you really going to India, Mr. McCray? Aye, I am. Once and for all. India, that's my old stamping ground. Must give you some letters of introduction, my boy. Oh, India, India. Richard and George Ann were born there, you know. They were? Yes, poor dears. They were born there. Such an awful place. I've never been there myself. But they've told me all about it. Mommy. That's very astonishing, very. Oh, don't mind, Mommy. She has little lapses like that. Nothing dangerous. Perhaps we'd better die. Uh, excellent suggestion. Miss Fortune, may I have the honor? Oh, Colonel. Why, I haven't danced and I couldn't tell you how long. All the more reason, ma'am. My arm, Miss Fortune. Permit me to say, ma'am, that you dance exquisitely. It is. It is a, a beautiful, a beautiful waltz, isn't it? With you, ma'am, it's a poem. Oh, look, look. There's George Ann and Mr. McRae. They're waltzing, too. They must have made up. Oh, oh, I'm so glad. Made up? Made up? I didn't realize they'd quarreled about anything. Oh, there are a great many things you don't know uh, about your family, Colonel. Or, or about yourself. I don't understand you, ma'am. No, but someday, perhaps you, perhaps you will. You know, I think... Miss Ellen, what I is it? Oh, oh... Oh, I think... Miss Ellen, Miss Ellen. Damn, damn, what's happened here? Uh, Miss Ellen's fainted. Uh, get her dog. Go down to quick. Oh, it's horrible waiting like this. Why don't they tell us something? Anything? I spoke to the doctor about an hour ago. I, I didn't want to tell you. Dick, oh, what did he say, Richard? Go on, son. She's barely conscious. She talked for a moment about us, and she sent for Anstruther. She sent for Anstruther? Oh, Sahib, I'm so ashamed. My dear, my dear. Dick. What? Dick, do you think she's going to die? I don't know. But do you care if she dies, Dick? Well, I'm rather, rather used to the old girl. I'm very fond of her. Oh, we're horrible people, aren't we? Hard as nails, all of us. Oh, don't you think people ever change? No, no, not us ever. We just aren't any good. No, I guess you're right. Uh, Mr. Anstruther. How is she, Mr. Anstruther? Yes, how, how is she, sir? I'm Miss Fortune's lawyer, not her doctor. He will inform you at the proper time. Since I am her lawyer, however, there's a little matter that may perhaps interest you. Miss Fortune's one thought, despite her grave condition, has been to live long enough to set her signature to a new will. This she's done. I need not inform you as to the identity of the legatees. I might add, however, that if certain circumstances had been different, I, I should have advised Miss Fortune most strongly in favor of a more impersonal charity. As it is, it makes little difference. What are you trying to tell us? In the past few years, there's been a steady depreciation in the value of Miss Fortune's holdings. I didn't wish to worry Miss Fortune in her late years by telling her because I thought, well, perhaps things might be managed for her alone. But if Miss Fortune dies, taking debt and taxes into account... The estate will be practically penniless. I trust you'll find it possible to forgive her. Why should we forgive her, Mr. Anstruther? That's a strange thing you're asking of us. And what is there to forgive? Wasn't she good to us? As for the money, we don't want it. Oh, Mommy. Absolutely not. We are perfectly able to stand on our own feet. Saib. Saib's right. He's working and so am I. My income isn't much yet, but I'm only up to chapter 12. Oh, Richard, what are you talking about? Wait till I finish that book. I'll show you. I'll show myself. Indeed. Then perhaps I might add that if Miss Fortune lives, I doubt that I shall be able even to save this house for if her. If Miss Fortune lives, Mr. Anstruther, you can rest assured there'll be a home for her always, with us. She won't need this house. We'll take care of her. Well, if I've misjudged you, I, I beg your pardon. Good night. Oh, 
Oh, Mommy, you do love her. Darling, darling. We don't want the money. We don't want it, none of us. There, there, darling. And we really want to be what she thinks we are. Oh, Mommy. Mommy, she mustn't die. She mustn't. We've got to show her. We've got to take care of her. Oh, Mommy, she saved us. Don't you see? She saved us all. Darling, darling. Oh, Mommy. Well, well, Doctor? You may come in now. Miss Fortune wants to see you. She seems to be very much stronger. Come in. Come in. Uh, Miss Ellen, there's, there's something we want to tell you, all of us. Oh. Uh, you mustn't disturb the patient. Doctor's orders, you know. It, it's about us. We... There's nothing you can tell me about yourselves. I know you all so well. I told the doctor. He thought I was going to die. And I said, Doctor, I don't want to die now, not yet. I don't want to leave my friends. I can't leave my friends. There you are. What do you think of the sign? Rosebank Manor, Colonel Anthony Carlton. <clears throat> Side. Uh, yes, George Ann? Uh, didn't you make a slight mistake, darling? Mistake? Oh, yes, so I did. Here, hand me that paintbrush, Duncan. Aye, sir. Yes, this won't take a moment. Here we go. Now, there, see? See? Rosebank Manor, Mr. Anthony Carlton. That's better. <laughs> Much better. Oh, it's a lovely house, Sahib. I haven't seen such a beautiful setting since the old days in India. Uh, where, Mommy? Uh, Canada. You know, Mrs. McCray, I wonder if we ought to go to India after all. Duncan, darling, will you please stop talking about India once and for all? And that wing there, that's for Miss Ellen. And here, these are my quarters, Leslie. Oh, very nice. Isn't it rather large for a single man? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, twin beds, too. What do you want with twin beds? Well, I, uh, I'm, a, I'm a very restless sleeper. I, I couldn't sleep in only one bed. Uh, it's a carryover from the old days, and we used to have to move out of places in the middle of the night. I see. Well, say, here's, uh, here's something that might interest you, Leslie. My old scrapbook. See? Good publicity, huh? Look, uh, look at this item here. Carlton family arrives at Riviera. Yes, I heard about oh, that. Oh, they're <laughs> great days, those. Uh, Carlton family proved to be imposters. The police have asked them to leave the Riviera on the early... Richard, don't. Uh, wait a minute, just, just one more. Richard Carlton announces engagement. Mr. Richard Carlton announced today that he will propose marriage to Miss Leslie Saunders at the earliest possible moment. He's very much in doubt as to his worthiness, but he hopes by hard work and honest endeavor to prove himself suitable. He loves her very much. Richard. He's waiting now for her answer. Oh, Richard. Darling. Which seems to be yes. Looking very pleased about the change she made in the Carlton family, May Robeson returns for a curtain call with Donna Michi and Ida Lupino. Curtain call? Oh, how those children do grow up. <laughs> you know, I knew that boy when he wore three-cornered pants. Why, Miss Robeson, I didn't realize that you'd known him that long. Well, it's all news to me, too, but naturally I'm very proud of him. Why should you be proud? Well, of knowing you that long, Miss Robeson. What can I call you, Muzzy May, now? You can call me anything you like, my dear, but I wasn't <laughs> alluding to you. I was talking about that other youngster, Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> now, 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 May, May you're, you're, you're not going to tell them about, about the time... About the time you... I spanked you? Well, why not? You richly deserved it. Don, <laughs> I think this revelation may have a bad effect on Lux Radio Theater discipline. What a thrill that must be, spanking a producer. Yes. And that's not the only time I'd like to have spanked him, too. No? <laughs> but he was a cute little youngster, little gold curls all over his face. <laughs> 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 but honestly, you know, Cecil, it's been a real joy and pleasure to be on the Lux Radio Theater, especially with such a wonderful cast and those grand stars, Don Amici and Ida Lupino. By the way, who are you going to have next week? Well, May, we're, we're planning to have... Uh, well, I, I tell you, before I tell you who we're planning to have, I want to tell Don that it's only a few years that... Uh, 
May has stopped greeting me with, my, how you've grown. <laughs> CB, I know just exactly how you feel, but uh, look, who, who is going to be on next week, CB? Well, next week, uh... Well, do, do you really want me well, to tell you? Well, before you tell us about next week's play, Mr. Lemille, <laughs> I'd like to say something about the product behind this theater. I've used Lux Soap for years, and it's certainly a grand help in keeping my complexion soft and smooth. I often tell people about what a fine beauty aid Lux Soap really is. <laughs> Your beauty speaks for itself, Ida. Next Monday night, we present two very distinguished players, Charles Lawton and Elsa Lancaster. Our play will be The Sidewalks of New York. Adapted to the sidewalks of London, pardon me. <laughs> My apologies to London and Charlie. <laughs> it's adapted from the, the much-talked-about motion picture soon to be released by Paramount. It's a romantic story of, of two street entertainers who make a precarious living by singing and dancing on the sidewalks of London. <laughs> This picture's already proved one of the hits of the year in England. And it gives Charles Lawton a new type of part. And I'm sure the sidewalks of London, with Charles Lawton and Elsa Lanchester and Alan Marshall, will make a hit with you next Monday night. Well, when you've got Charles Lawton and Elsa Lanchester and Alan Marshall as your stars, I'll be right in front of the radio listing. Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> you've made us all young and hot tonight. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Toilet Soap, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Charles Lawton and Elsa Lanchester in the sidewalks of London with Alan Marshall. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Heard in tonight's play were Eric Snowden as Colonel Carlton, Frederick Shields as Duncan, Leela Tyler as Mrs. Carlton, Thomas Mills as Butler, and Philip Steed as Doctor. Don Amici is now appearing in the 20th Century Fox picture, Swanee River. Ida Lupino's current picture is Paramount's The Light That Failed, starring Ronald Colgan. May Robeson has just finished the RKO picture, Irene. The Young and Heart was adapted from the novel by I.A.R. Wiley, The Gay Banditti. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Roig. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>